And I hope that you choose Park Place to be with us to do that. So we're working through the Gospel of Mark. Now, every Palm Sunday, I preach on the triumphal entry, and I'm not going to do that today. And that may disappoint some people, but I want to just share with you that the story that I shared earlier uh, is the triumphal entry into Jerusalem with Jesus. But I want to continue because I really felt like this particular story was needed for today. And it's taken from Mark 10, 17 through 31. And then we will close our service uh, by partaking in communion. Now, he was going out on the road, that is Jesus. One came running. Everybody say running. It's important. He knelt before him and asked, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. Now, this particular piece of scripture has always confused me a little bit. It's confused me because Jesus is saying that only one is good and that is God. Let me help you to understand. Jesus says, why do you call me good? This is not Jesus denying his deity, my friends. Instead, he invited the young man to reflect upon it. It is as if Jesus is saying, do you really know what you are saying when you call me good? I'm more than good. I'm God. I'm more than good. I am the Son of God. I am God the Son. I am going to the cross. I will pay for your penalty. And I will redeem you. I am the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But Jesus wants more information. He says, the man says to Jesus, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? The focus of the man's question is not on Jesus, but on what I should do, my friends. He thought eternal life was a matter of earning and deserving, not a relationship. Time out. Listen to me, my friends. You cannot earn your salvation. You do not deserve your salvation. He who accomplished much in his lifetime wanted to accomplish this as well. He goes to the good teacher and he says, what do I need to do? My friends, this is the difference between religion and being born again. Religion doesn't save you, my friends. It makes you Pharisaic. It makes you self-righteous. But only Jesus can do the work that you long for him to do in your life. But the Bible says he bowed down on his knees in front of Jesus. Yes, it does, my friends. I asked you to say that he came running. You used the word. The Bible says that he knelt before him. So he ran and he kneeled before Jesus. The mere closeness of that relationship made him closer to salvation than anything else he could do. So many people walk up the steps of heaven and knock on the door only to turn around and come back down. Some people don't realize how close they are to the kingdom of God and yet never find it. He didn't want Jesus to be his savior. He wanted Jesus to show him the way to be his own savior. The man really didn't know who he was. He thought that he was a righteous man and didn't really know the kind of person that he truly was. You see, if you think you're righteous, be sure you're right. Take heed lest you fall, my friends. When you don't know who Jesus is, you probably don't know who you are either. Because if you can remember back before you were saved, you didn't know who you truly were until you were found. But knowing Jesus comes first. Your identity is supposed to be in Christ because you were made in His image. 
verse 19 says, you know the commandments, Jesus says, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. He answered and said to him, teacher, all of these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Say, loved him. And he said to him, one thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, take up your cross, and follow me. But he was sad at this word, and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Let me just stop and remind you that, boy, he starts out really strong. He runs to Jesus Mark tells us he got on his knees before Jesus. He is at the throne of God, my friends. He's so close to the kingdom. But then he brings it back to himself. Just as sometimes we choose religion over spirituality, even though we know better. But Jesus says to him, there's one thing that you're lacking Go your way, give everything you have to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven first. Second is, he said, take up your cross and follow me. Friday is Good Friday. Jesus is saying, take up your cross and follow me. He doesn't say this often. He said it to some of the disciples, but this time he's speaking to a religious Jew who is very wealthy, and he says, take up your cross and follow me. That's not what he expected to hear, my friends. I just told you I am self-righteous. I just told you that I haven't broken the commandments. I just told you that I am wealthy. You know who I am, Jesus. Now you're saying, sell my possessions and take up the cross? The criminal's cross? A thief's cross? A murderer's cross? You're obviously not listening. We have a way of sharing our resume with people, don't we? It comes from pride and ego sometimes. I admit, just like anybody else, I'm not exempt. I have to be very careful of the thoughts that I have and that the Lord keep me humble because I can be self-righteous. You see, maybe I see myself a little bit in this man's story. Maybe you do too. Because he says, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth, that's what he says. In his reply, this ruler said of himself that he had kept all these commandments and that he has done so since his childhood. This was actually possible according to the way these commandments were commonly interpreted. But impossible according to the true meaning of God. Interpretation of the commandments. You see, God interpreted the commandments a little bit more strictly than the Pharisees taught. In Philippians 3, 6, Paul struggled with this. Paul said that he thought he had kept all the commandments as a religious Jew. He wrote of his thinking at that time that he was concerning the righteousness, righteousness which is in the law blameless. This is the Apostle Paul. According to the interpretation of the law, he considered himself blameless, my friends. Yet in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gave us the real meaning of the law. It goes to the heart, not just the actions. You can have a heart filled with adultery even if you never commit it. 
You can have a heart filled with murder even if you never do it. You can have a heart that steals even if you never steal. God looks at the heart as well as the actions. The Bible says, do not steal, but do you covet? Jimmy Carter, back in, I think it was 1976, was interviewed. Had he ever committed adultery as he was preparing for the presidency? He said, and I quote, I've committed adultery in my heart many times. Some of you remember that. I just love that he is such a, such a humble man to be able to say that. It was actually a Playboy interview for what it's worth, and he was being very honest. The man should have responded, there is no way I have kept or can keep all of the law completely, so therefore I need a Savior. But my friends, you can't get a man found until you get him lost. You cannot be saved until you know you're a sinner. There are people that come to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday all across America that don't believe that they're bad. My job is not to break you down. That's God's job. My job is not to condemn you. That is the Holy Spirit's job. My job is not to make you feel worse than you already feel. That may be your wife's job. <laughs> or your husband's job. I'm kidding. My job is just to remind you that if there is some self-righteousness there which we all struggle with from time to time, God can't use you, my friends, unless you pour that out and realize that you are a sinner that needs to be saved by grace because you're just not good enough. I'm not good enough. I never was created to be good enough. So, pastor, how do I know the difference between religion and being born again? I get asked this question from time to time because there are many people in the church like this rich, young ruler. They have a righteousness of their own. And I just say to them, listen, my friends, when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, it is because you have surrendered your life to God accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior because you are a filthy mess because of the sin in your life. And nobody can clean it up like Jesus. And you've asked him to do it. Because you can't clean up your own mess. You're not good enough. You're not rich enough. You're not favored enough to clean it up yourself. Only Jesus can clean up that kind of mess. But Jesus looked at him and loved him and said, in verse 21, I love that Jesus looked at him. I love that Mark says he loved him, which I asked you to repeat after me. And he said to him, Jesus loved him. Do you know that Jesus loves you while you're a sinner? While we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. Jesus was filled with loving compassion for this man because his life was so empty. He had climbed to the top of the ladder of success only to find that his ladder leaned against the wrong building, my friends. And so is your co-workers and people within your family and your neighbors and maybe even yourself. He did not choose to love God more than his wealth, even though Jesus specifically promised him treasure in heaven. Let's put these two things together. We're talking about a rich, young ruler, my friends. Rich, young ruler is being told two things. First, you will have treasure in heaven, not this stuff you have over here. 
treasure in heaven. If you will just give away this junk, you can have treasure in heaven. And then take your cross and follow me. The man was more interested in earthly treasure of men than in God's heavenly treasures. The man was essentially an idolater. Wealth was his God instead of the true God known as Jesus because he put money before God. Some of us work too much. Some people are workaholics. Some people are always preoccupied with that next purchase. I struggled with this recently because I do some painting on the side, and so I decided that I needed to have a new vehicle, one of those Ford Connect vehicles. You know, they're kind of like a minivan, but they're cargo. And you put ladders on the top. And so I called my brother-in-law who works at Ford, and he said he could get me on the A plan, which knocks off about three grand. And I went on the website, and I picked out exactly uh, what I wanted, what features, you know, I guess the van would have. And um, after I had already kind of almost completed my order, I shared with Sweet Dina that, um, you know, what I'm going to do is sell my, my little uh, paint wagon. Some of you have seen it. She calls it a bread truck. Looks like milk truck, milk truck. And um, it's not very sexy, I know, but um, nevertheless, it's a cargo vehicle and it's perfect for me, but it's got a lot of miles on it. So she said, what's the payment going to be? And I said, well, I think we can put half down and finance the rest of it. And we started breaking down the numbers. And she wondered, well, how much painting are you planning on doing? And how much money do you think you can make on the side? And I started to realize that as we were crunching numbers together, this didn't really fit our budget. You know, just like you, we have a budget too. And um, I was being selfish. And I, this wasn't a vehicle that I needed. It was a vehicle that I wanted. And I wanted it because it would have driven nice. It was a convenient vehicle. It's a four-cylinder. There's a lot of good things about this particular vehicle, but it wasn't God's will for me. Now, maybe it's God's will for somebody else, and maybe you prayed about your purchase, and God gave you peace with it. But I, for one, have bought a vehicle without God's peace. And I don't like that feeling. And I bought a vehicle without my wife's blessing, and I don't like that feeling either. It's not the one I drove today. That one I had her blessing for. But I want God's blessing. And if there's treasure waiting for me in heaven, I know nothing about that. I can't imagine that. But I do look forward to a day when I get to explore what it's like to be with Jesus face to face in glory in heaven rather than have treasure on earth. Jesus said in verse 21, come take up the cross and follow me. This man, like all men by nature, had an orientation toward a works of righteousness. He asked an honest question, what should I do? If we really want to do the works of God, it must begin with believing on Jesus, whom the Father has sent to us. Jesus, I propose, wasn't to make the man sad, yet he could only be happy by doing what Jesus told him to do, but he went away sorrowful. Many people have almost everything, and yet they are full of sorrow. Some of the most wealthy people that you've ever met are empty. I know it's hard for you to believe, but it's true. I haven't met many millionaires, and I don't think I've ever met a billionaire, but I've met some, and several of them are very empty. Verse 23, then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard is it for those 
who trust in riches, that is riches of this world, to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, then who can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. So you cannot save yourselves, my friends. Jesus says how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astonished at his words. That Jesus' words amazed them because the disciples assumed that wealth was a sign of God's blessing and favor. They thought that the rich were especially saved. If you want to know how God feels about money, look at the people he gives it to. I know that's still sinking in. It's not a joke. If you want to know how God feels about money, take a look at people who have it, need it, work hard for it. I'm not degrading money and stewardship. What I am saying to you, my friends, if it is that important to you, God will let you have it. But at what cost? The world has money. You see them on TV. You see them on the news. They've created something. They've developed something. They built something. It makes no difference to me, my friends. For I know there are wealthy people in the Bible, but if you want to know how truly God feels about money, look who has it. Not a lot of Christians who has God as their main priority. Verse 25, Jesus says, for those who have riches. We often excuse ourselves from what Jesus said here because we don't consider ourselves rich. Yet compared to this rich young ruler, each and every one of us enjoys more luxuries and comforts than he did. Some people think about riches not realizing that the joy of the Lord is their wealth. We may contrast the dependence of a child with independence of a rich man. Jesus indicated it was much more likely that a child would inherit the kingdom of God instead of a rich, self-righteous man, my friends. Perhaps more importantly, the wealthy man is often a successful doer. He has done well, so he is rich. It is very easy for him to think that salvation and the relationship with the Lord is also a matter of successful doing when really it is about humbly receiving what God has for you. That is surrender. Jesus says it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Because with man, salvation is like a camel going through the eye of a needle. With God, it is possible. You see, the camel was the largest animal found in Palestinian soil. The violent contrast between the largest animal and the smallest opening expresses what, humanly speaking, is impossible and quite honestly absurd, my friends. But in verse 27, Jesus says that with God all things are possible. God's grace is sufficient to save the rich man. Biblically speaking, we have the examples of Zacchaeus, Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, Barnabas. And through history, we have many examples of wealthy people. I include Lazarus quite possibly to the list, as a wealthy person. People say money is the root to all evil. But that's not true. 
1 Timothy 6.10 reminds us that love of money is the root to evil. Verse 28, then Peter began to say to him, see, we have left all and followed you. So Jesus answered and said, surely, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and yet in the age to come, they will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Some of the disciples were confused by this, that, that, that there are rich people that can't go to heaven, and there are poor people that are allowed in. And so this is a contrast of thought and maybe even some of their philosophy. So in contrast to the rich young ruler, the disciples had left everything to follow Jesus. So what will be their reward? They're asking, if he can't get into heaven, who can? If he can't get into heaven, can I get into heaven? That's an honest question. That's what they were asking, my friends. Jesus says, you've left your homes. Peter probably left his wife, his mother-in-law. Though that might not have been that difficult, I'm not sure. They left their professions. They left their livelihood. They left their friends, their hometown. I have a very difficult time with pastors who can't leave their hometown. Ordained by God called to preach the gospel, yet won't leave their family, won't leave their town, because it's uncomfortable, my friends. When God calls a man or a woman into ministry, it is crystal clear, you go where he tells you to go. Some pastors can't leave their hometown. Peter left everything. The disciples left everything. My friends, you are called to leave everything. There isn't a thing that you are permitted to take if God calls you somewhere. Leave it behind and receive the treasure that is waiting for you in heaven that God wants to bless you with. So they say, there is no one. Jesus says, there is no one who has left houses or brothers who shall not receive a hundredfold. So I have one single stake over here, but a hundredfold over here, my friends. There will be universal honor for all who sacrifice for Jesus' sake. Whatever is given up for him will be returned many times over in eternal life. And yet we continue to hold on to tangible things with, within this world. I've always told you that possessions are not a bad thing if you have them. But do they have you? I can't answer that question for you, my friends. It's okay to have possessions, but do your possessions have you? It's okay to have money, but does your money have you? You see, that's a question that you have to grapple with and maybe take to the Lord and pray about, my friends. I read the news like so many of you, and there's always this discussion, or, or I guess it's a report about people who win these scratch-offs, you know? The, the, the lotteries, and some tickets are $5, $10. I believe there's some tickets that are scratch-offs you get at the 7-Eleven, all the way up to $50. Is that true? All the people who scratch off say yes. <laughs> Just teasing you, Leroy. I think it's $50. Can you imagine dropping $50? Oh, but pastor, I read one out of three wins. I'm going to drop 
because one out of three wins. My friends, where is your treasure? Where is your heart? Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. My heart is at Park Place Church. I've been here four and a half years and I'm not leaving. I want to be here as long as God has me here. And it doesn't matter what I lose in the process. And it seems like every year I lose a little bit more. I won't leave until God releases me. And I can't leave until God releases me. But so it is with you, my friends. God puts his finger on certain things in your life. It's not always just sin. It's not always just your behavior. It's not always just your actions. Sometimes he puts his, his finger on your possessions and your pocketbook, your checkbook, your bank statement that you pull off each month and look at how you spent your money and you feel ashamed because you've been unwise with your funds. Notice I said your funds. Because they're not yours. If you are a child of God, everything you have is God's. What Jesus was saying to the rich young ruler, and I'm going to close with this. What Jesus was saying to the rich young ruler is, can I, can I interpret without getting in trouble with you? Sell all my possessions and give to the poor. I, I, I know I'm taking it out of context and maybe somebody's going to be offended by that and you can see me after the service, but if you are a child of God and this was a good, righteous, Jewish man of God, my friends, and they weren't his possessions. Everything he received is from the hand of God. And everything we receive is from the hand of God. Sell every possession I ever gave you. Sell everything that you hold dear, that is clenched within your hand. And give it to the poor. And you will be blessed, my friends. As I'm preaching this, it's really about stewardship. But you know what? It's really about surrender as well. Because we hold on to things and we want to manage and control our finances. How much can you give? How much can you give the Lord? Can you give Him more time? We got church work days for that. Can you give him more effort? We have ministries set up for that. Can you give more money? We receive tithes and offerings, my friends. Can you give more of yourself? Because you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Everything you have is God's. Even your very body. So be a good steward of it. Thank God for it. It's a gift. It's a blessing. And it's a blessing to give it away. Whatever it is. Unclench that fist, my friend. For some of you, it may be a repetitive sin in your life. For some of you, it's gossip. Malicious talk or coarse joking. For some of you, it's paying half your, half your tithe or maybe haven't paid your tithe in a while. Maybe you haven't supported the building fund like you promised you would. For some of you, it's your children. You haven't released them to the Lord. For some of you, it's your pride. We all struggle with these things, my friends. You're not alone. But there is freedom in surrender. There's freedom in letting go, giving it to God, and let God pour down the blessings upon you. 
that are oftentimes not materialists. They don't have to be materials. They can just be the joy of the Lord, the cleansing of a heart that has been made new again. God wants to do a great work in your life. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we give you our anger. We give you our coarse joking and malicious talk. We give you our possessions. We give you our finances because they're not ours anyway. Help us not to be like the rich young ruler who wanted to do what he could do to inherit eternal life. Help us to realize that we can't white-knuckle this thing. We can't hold on to it. We're not self-righteous enough to earn it, to receive it. But peace comes through surrender. Help us to open up our hands. Everyone in this sanctuary right now, I want you to open up your palms. Palms to the sky. Jesus, look at us now. Our palms are open. We want to be laid bare before you. You see, there is nothing in our hands right now. Let us not leave this place enslaved to anything in this world, but to your word and your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, my friends. As we prepare our hearts for communion, I want to remind you that koinonia is the Greek word for communion. It just means it's an act of sharing together. It's a spiritual fellowship. As we prepare our hearts for communion, I want to remind you that in the Wesleyan Church, all are welcome at the Lord's table. If you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you may partake the elements with me in just a minute or two. But I want to make sure if there is any sin that has not been repented for, let us now take a moment in silent reflection and prayer and give that back over to the Lord. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Amen. Clearly the church is referred to as a body. One body because there are many members who have different functions and God has no respect for one person over another in the body of Christ. So the idea that Paul is teaching to the church in Corinth is that there is one bread. There is one bread and he is the bread of life. His name is Jesus. Yet there are many members of his body and that there is not one who is less than the other. The body of Christ is beautiful, my friends. And one day, I believe very soon, Jesus will come again to receive his beautiful bride. True bread that is from heaven, Jesus said in John chapter 6. He is the true bread that was given up for you. And his blood was real drink that was shed upon the cross. And he told his disciples, do this as often as you do in remembrance of me, remembering the crucifixion, the penalty that I paid for you. You see, that was my debt on the cross. And it was your debt on the cross. As we prepare for communion, is there anyone here who would just raise their hand and say, I didn't receive the elements? There's one over there, right over here. We've got people that will help you out. Keep your hands up until they come over. Thank you. We want to make sure everybody gets served. Anybody else not receive the elements? Pastor Dwayne, right over here. Anybody else? All right.
Jesus was enjoying the time together with his disciples, and it was known as the Last Supper. And there we go. When the supper had ended, he took the bread. He broke it. He gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take this bread and eat from it. This is my body, which is given up for you. You may partake of the little piece of bread on the top as a sacrament of Jesus' body, which was broken for us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus was willing to go to the cross. We are thankful, Lord, that his body was bruised and that all the weight of the world's sin was placed upon his shoulders. How broad those shoulders are that carries my sin. How strong and mighty is the man who died for me. Each and every one of us can say the same. Thank you, Jesus, for doing for me what I could not do for myself. And he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he said, Drink it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you do in remembrance of me. You may drink the juice. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I can't imagine how much blood was poured out for me. It's the worst way to die. And we use the cross as a symbol of our great love for what Jesus did for us. He bled and suffered for my sin and theirs. And I thank you, Jesus, that you count me worthy to suffer for you. I have it so good, Lord. We all do. Help us to examine our heart this morning to see if there's any offense in us, Lord, that we may ask for forgiveness, knowing that you paid it all. You paid the price. And we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to close with a song. We're going to close with a song. So I would invite Mandy to come forward. And I ask you to stand, please. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed.
go in peace this afternoon. You are dismissed.